Good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Riskified's fourth quarter 2023 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you'll need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to hand the conference over to your first speaker, Chet Mendel, Riskified's Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Chet Mandel, Riskified's Head of Investor Relations. We are hosting today's call to discuss Riskified's financial results for the full year and fourth quarter of 2023. Participating on today's call are Ido Gal, Riskified's co-founder and chief executive officer, and Aggie Docheva, Riskified's chief financial officer. We released our results for the full year and fourth quarter of 2023 earlier today. Our earnings materials, including a replay of today's webcast, will be available on our Investor Relations website at ir.riskified.com. Certain statements made on the call today will be forward-looking statements related to our operating performance, business and financial goals, outlooks as to revenues, gross profit margin, adjusted EBITDA profitability, adjusted EBITDA margins, and expectations as to positive cash flows, which reflect management's best judgment based on currently available information and are not guarantees of future performance. We intend all forward-looking statements to be covered by the safe harbor provisions contained in the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These forward-looking statements reflect our expectations as of the date of this call, and except as required by law, we undertake no obligation to revise this information as a result of new developments that may occur after the time of this call. These forward-looking statements involve risks, uncertainties, and other factors, some of which are beyond our control that could cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations. You should not put undue reliance on any forward-looking statement. Please refer to our annual report on Form 20F for the year ended December 31st, 2023, and subsequent reports we file or furnish with the SEC for more information on the specific factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations. Additionally, we will discuss certain non-GAAP financial measures and key performance indicators on the call. Reconciliations to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures are available in our earnings release issued earlier today and also furnished with the SEC on Form 6K and in the appendix of our Investor Relations presentation, all of which are posted on our Investor Relations website. I will now turn the call over to Edo. Thanks, Jet, and hello, everyone. I'm proud to report that Riskified ended the year strong despite facing macroeconomic and geopolitical headwinds. We entered 2023 looking to increase our new logo base, further penetrate our existing accounts, expand our geographic footprint, and strengthen our platform sales motion while improving our technology and achieving profitability on an adjusted EBITDA basis in the fourth quarter. I am pleased that we were able to accomplish our 2023 goals, but acknowledge our work is not yet done. In particular, I am excited about achieving a gross margin of 58% in the fourth quarter. We believe that the cumulative multi-year impact of focusing on the continuous advancement of our technology stack contributed to an outstanding fourth quarter. This represents our highest gross margin in 10 quarters, all while maintaining very high levels of performance for our merchants. Allow me to provide some further insight into our technology strategy. In 2023, we focused on a three-pronged approach to drive improved performance while we expanded deeper into new geographies industries, and payment methods. We strengthened our machine learning factory by leaning further into autonomously training models. This allows us to train, test, and deploy models more quickly, which in turn expands the capacity of our data scientists to develop and enhance additional features to drive powerful performance. And finally, we built out an automated performance management platform designed to optimize approval and chargeback rates per merchant in an automated and constant way. We believe that this automation will allow us to continue to scale the business with high leverage. I am optimistic that some of the leverage seen in Q4 will flow through to 2024 and beyond, but I encourage you to continue analyzing our gross margin on an annual basis, given individual quarters can vary due to many factors, including the ranking of new merchants and the risk profiles of transactions approved. 
I want to thank the team for their attention in responding so quickly from third quarter fraud event to achieve such fantastic results in Q4. We have further diversified our portfolio across merchants, industries, and geographies to become a more broad-based and resilient company that is able to continue to grow across all macro environments. We continue to have success penetrating the e-commerce landscape through new merchant wins and through upsells within our existing merchant white space, which contributed to total annual GMV growth of 17% and total annual revenue growth of 14% in 2023. Heidi will walk you through the drivers of our top line growth shortly, but overall, I am encouraged by our performance in 2023. In particular, five out of our six verticals contributed positively to our performance during the year. All of our regions achieved at least double-digit growth year over year, and we have more enterprise merchants' accounts on our platform than ever before. In fact, we had over 50 accounts that contributed one million or more to our top line in 2023. Our go-to-market team met their annual revenue targets and delivered a strong end of the year, with one-third of the new merchant activity in 2023 coming in the fourth quarter, providing positive momentum heading into 2024. Also, in our first full year of having a refined platform sales strategy, new bookings derived from our Policy Protect, Dispute Resolve, and Account Secure products were up approximately three times. Our fourth quarter was the strongest quarter ever for our Policy Protect product, as over 50% of the Policy Protect deals that we won during the year went live during the quarter. And while the revenue from these products still represents only a small percentage of our overall revenue base, we believe that our ability to sell an end-to-end platform has proven to be a very successful differentiator and stickiness tool. We executed and focused on improving our technology stack throughout the year. For example, based on direct feedback from our merchants, we increased the number of use cases we helped solve beyond just blocking fraudulent refunds and serial returners to also solve promo abuse, item limits, and reseller policies for our Policy Protect product. On Dispute Resolve, we prioritized developing a holistic and automated solution for the fraud and non-fraud chargeback representment process. This product allows us to become a one-stop shop that automates the entire dispute flow to help reduce higher win rates for our merchants. Both products are proving to have a true market need based on recent activity and existing pipeline and serve as key tools in our land and expand strategy. The new product traction we've seen and the enhancements we've made, combined with our market-leading core chargeback guarantee offering, led to a very strong fourth quarter overall win rate of almost 80%. The proven performance, accuracy, and predictability that our core chargeback guarantee product generates is why merchants are initially drawn to Riskified. Now, our expanded end-to-end platform dedicated to solving multiple high-value e-commerce use cases gives them even more reason to stay. This is evident in our low churn numbers. Our annual dollar retention in 2023 was 98% which was inclusive of a few unusual churn events as a result of merchant bankruptcies. We are proud of the deep-rooted partnerships that we have built with many of the world's largest e-commerce merchants. Moving lower in the income statement and onto the areas that are more within our operational control. In mid-2022, we made the decision to accelerate our timeline to profitability and have executed on that accelerated timeframe. Our 2023 annual adjusted EBITDA of negative 8.5 million exceeded our guidance by 37%. And we achieved positive free cash flow for the year of 5.9 million. Furthermore, our 2023 annual adjusted EBITDA margin expanded by 1,100 basis points from the prior year. I am pleased that we have achieved positive adjusted EBITDA in the fourth quarter and that we are guiding to positive adjusted EBITDA on an annual basis in 2024 and beyond. We have made a lot of progress in getting to this point, and I believe it is important to communicate how to think about the financial milestones we plan on achieving over the next few years. As a management team, we are building towards adjusted EBITDA margins between 15 and 20% by 2026. In addition, We also plan on achieving positive adjusted EBITDA 
inclusive of our share-based compensation expenses by 2026. Allow me to provide some further context. Over the past two years, we have faced a challenging macro environment and volatile consumer spending, which has led to a net dollar retention in the low hundreds, down significantly from higher rates of 115 to over 120 that we've seen historically, even pre-COVID. Overall, this has produced lower growth rates than our historical norm and is not where we aspire to be longer term. We remain focused on accelerating our revenue growth, and we believe that there are multiple ways to achieve that. As a leader in e-commerce fraud and risk intelligence, we believe that we can capitalize on the large opportunities in front of us. As always, our goal remains to land and expand our platform with the world's largest e-commerce merchants, and the speed and frequency at which we are able to execute on this strategy is a top area of focus. In addition, potential improvements to our same cohort base would also result in a more positive impact on our net dollar retention rate which would also allow us to grow revenue faster. However, even at similar revenue growth rates as compared to the last few years, we are confident in our ability to manage the business and how to optimize the operational levers available to us in our gross margin and OPEX line items to continue driving adjusted EBITDA improvements in order to achieve these targets. Overall, I am confident in our ability to efficiently run the business to constantly bring our top line growth down to the bottom line. Before I turn it over to Agi to provide further color on our results and on our 2024 annual guide, it's important to highlight our commitment to managing share-based compensation expense and dilution to meaningfully lower levels than they are currently at. First, in 2023, share-based compensation expense as a percentage of revenue decreased by approximately 500 basis points from 2022. And in 2023, we granted approximately 30% fewer equity awards as compared to 2022. We expect to see share-based compensation as a percentage of revenue continue to decline in 2024. Many of the larger awards that we granted in 2021 through 23 have a four to five year vesting period And as these awards complete their vesting requirements by the end of 26, we expect to see a meaningful drop-off in our share-based compensation expenses. Second, and perhaps even more important to discuss, is our focus on controlling our equity awards to meaningfully lower levels. In 2023, equity awards granted represented approximately 6% of our weighted average dilutive shares, down from approximately 9% in 22. We anticipate that this number will be approximately 4 to 5% in 24 as we continue to manage the business in a disciplined manner. Assuming valuation levels similar to today and absent any unanticipated executive or senior hiring and any additional buyback authorization, we expect to target similar levels going forward. Third, since the implementation of our 75 million share repurchase program in November, we have repurchased approximately 7.6 million shares at a total cost of 34 million as of February 29th. We remain committed to repurchasing our shares at what we believe are attractive valuation levels. Looking forward, we are excited and energized by the opportunity in front of us in 24. There is plenty of white space for us to penetrate, and we believe that our product and platform leadership position will allow us to do that. Combined with the global network scale that we have built and the financial and operational discipline of our business model, I have great confidence that we are well positioned to execute on these initiatives for the benefit of our shareholders. Now, over to Agi. Thank you, Ida, team, and everyone for joining today's call. We achieved fourth quarter revenue of 84.1 million and full year revenue of 297.6 million up 6% year-over-year and 14% respectively. Our fourth quarter GMV of 35.2 billion was the highest quarter of volume reviewed in our history. This was driven by continued new and upsell growth and solid Black Friday through Cyber Monday holiday activity, which grew approximately 6% compared to last year's season. For the full year, we grew our GMV 17% 
$223.1 billion. During the fourth quarter, we had strong performance in our home category, primarily driven by upsell activity, and in our food category, primarily driven by new merchants. These two categories historically have not had large seasonal increases in the fourth quarter, unlike more traditional retailers, which tend to experience a higher holiday shopping season compared to other parts of the year. In addition, our fashion and luxury category remained relatively flat, similar to the first nine months of the year. Our ticket and travel category was also flat this quarter as we had a tougher comparable period in Q4 of 2022, driven by fewer large live events in the fourth quarter of this year. The combination of these factors contributed to the step down in our Q4 growth rate, but we remain bullish on these key categories and we expect to see tickets and travel return to growth in 2024. For the full year, approximately 30 million of the increase in revenue was attributable to increases in GMV and billings associated with new merchants, primarily within our tickets and travel category, which grew by more than 30% year over year. In addition, we saw 45% year over year growth in our food category and 19% growth in our home category. The remaining increase in revenue was primarily due to upsells, net of organic declines, and attrition, which contributed to our net dollar retention rate of 105%. Our ticket and travel category contributed just under 100 million in billings, which represented approximately 30% of our overall portfolio. In our travel portfolio of merchants, year-over-year activity was driven by a higher number of transactions for both flights and accommodations against relatively stable consumer pricing. Our fashion and luxury goods category, which represents approximately 30% of our portfolio, was relatively flat year over year. Throughout the year, we continued to see softness within our luxury brands and sneakers subsegments, which was positively offset by better growth in other subsegments, such as fast fashion, and by addition of new merchants and upsells within the category. Finally, we also saw growth in billings across all geographies year over year. The United States, which is our largest region, grew by 10%, and EMEA grew by 15%. Our Americas and APAC regions grew approximately 30 and 40% respectively, primarily due to momentum in new and upsell activity. We believe that our continued growth in regions outside of the United States demonstrates continued market share gains and validates our decision to invest in these regions. Overall, our contribution by region was more evenly distributed than in previous years as we continue to build a global and diversified company. As Ido mentioned, while our growth margin continues to be best analyzed on an annual basis, Allow me to provide more detail on how we achieved 58% non-GAAP growth margin in the fourth quarter. The ongoing improvements to our models and enhancements to our monitoring tools and systems led to better performance. Consistent with prior years, our fourth quarter tends to have a safer population of transactions than the rest of the year, and we did not have any unexpected fraud events. Also, as always, the timing of new revenue and merchant mix can impact the cross margin in a given quarter. Overall, the success of this quarter contributed to an annual non-GAAP gross profit margin of 52%. As Idel mentioned, we're expecting some of the margin expansion that we achieved in Q4 to carry into 2024. As it relates to 2024, for the full year, we're targeting a non-GAAP gross profit margin between 52 to 53%, which is 1% higher on each end than the initial range of 2023. Directionally, our first quarter margin is expected to be within this range, Q2 and Q3 are expected to be below the range, and Q4 is expected to be higher than the range. Moving to expenses. Total non-GAAP operating expenses were 39.4 million for the fourth quarter and 163.5 million for the full year of 2023, both representing a year-over-year decline of 6%.
we're becoming more efficient and have a deeper understanding of the working needs of each area of the business. We ended the year with decreased costs across most areas of spend, with savings generated through the negotiation of contracts in our AWS and other optimization efforts of our data sources, lower human resources expenses resulting from decreased headcount and recruiting needs, more focused spending in our sales and marketing line items, and savings from supplying space. For the year, our non-GAAP operating expenses as a percentage of revenue declined from 66% to 55%, reflecting leverage in the business model. We anticipate continuing to see further leverage in 2024 compared to 2023 and anticipate operating an approximately 40 million per quarter run rate. In addition, we have now substantially completed the global expansion of our go-to-market footprint, and we expect to start seeing improved leverage as we further realize the returns on these previous investments. In the fourth quarter, we achieved our strongest adjusted EBITDA results ever with 9.7 million in positive adjusted EBITDA. To highlight exactly how much progress we have made in achieving profitability, our adjusted EBITDA margin of 12% in the fourth quarter compares with minus 10 in Q4 of 2021, which was the first full quarter of operations following our IPO. For the year, we reported negative 8.5 million in adjusted EBITDA, an improvement of nearly 80% year over year. Our annual result represents 1,100 basis points expansion in our operating margin from the prior year. I'm extremely pleased by our ability to execute on our profitability goals on an accelerated timeline and have set ourselves up for profitability on an adjusted EBITDA basis in 2024. We will continue to seek ways to strengthen our adjusted EBITDA results in 2024. In addition, we continue to maintain a healthy cash flow model and achieved record positive free cash flow of 7.1 million in the fourth quarter. We generated positive free cash flow of 5.9 million during 2023, and we believe we are in a great position to continue generating strong free cash flow and expect approximately 30 million of positive free cash flow in 2024, assuming a constant capital allocation strategy. Moving to the balance sheet, we ended the year with approximately $475 million of cash, deposits, and investments on the balance sheet, and we carry zero debt. This amount represents a decline of approximately $3 million from last year, primarily due to our repurchase activity in the fourth quarter of 2023, offset by the strong free cash flow activity mentioned previously. This leads me to the topic of capital allocation. On November 20th, 2023, we received Israeli court approval to begin executing our previously announced share repurchase program. Since receiving this approval, we have been aggressive in utilizing this program to take advantage of what we believe are attractive repurchasing opportunities. In the fourth quarter, we repurchased approximately 3 million shares for a total price of approximately 13.1 million. As of February 29th, Year to date, we have repurchased an additional 4.5 million shares for a total price of 20.8 million. We anticipate that our repurchasing activity will more than offset the dilutive impact of equity issuances associated with option exercises and vesting of RSUs in 2024. At valuation levels well below that of companies with similar financial profiles, we believe that we have a great opportunity to continue repurchasing our stock at attractive prices. We continue to believe that our strong balance sheet and liquidity position are strong underappreciated assets. We will continue to be thoughtful in how we utilize our capital to drive shareholder value, including executing on additional repurchases and opportunistic bought on M&A. As we previously announced on February 13th, as part of our effort to drive faster and more meaningful progress towards our margin targets, we made a decision to reduce our global workforce by approximately 6%. 
We expect to recognize net operating expense savings related to this reduction of approximately $6 million on an annualized basis, subject to reinvestment, which is factored in our 2024 outlook. As a result of the reduction in force initiatives, we anticipate recording an incremental expense of approximately $2 million, primarily in the first quarter of 2024. This expense primarily relates to severance payments, employee benefits, and other costs related to the reduction in force. Charges incurred in connection with the reduction in force are excluded from adjusted EBITDA guidance. The actual amount mentioned could be first slightly from what is currently expected upon the completion of this reduction. We ended 2023 with 742 employees, a decline of 5% from the prior year, and following the completion of this reduction, we will have approximately 700 employees. Now turning to our outlook. As we look forward to 2024, we currently anticipate revenue of between 323 million and 335 million, or 329 million to the midpoint. Consistent with the past two years, we anticipate that our growth will be driven primarily by new activity, and at the midpoint of our guidance, we're forecasting a relatively similar net dollar retention rate as of 2023. The behavior of the macro environment, either positively or negatively, can impact our net dollar retention rate and may ultimately determine where we fall within our revenue range. In addition, we feel confident about the new business activity levels, which is supported by a more robust pipeline than at this point last year. Like we saw this year, the timing of when new merchants go live during the year can be difficult to predict and may have an impact on our calendar year revenues. For modeling purposes, we currently expect all of our quarters in 2024 to reflect a similar percentage of the total revenue as they did in 2023. Now let me discuss our adjusted EBITDA outlook. We currently expect adjusted EBITDA to be between 10 million and 17 million, or approximately 13.5 million to the midpoint. The midpoint of our adjusted EBITDA guide represents additional margin expansion of approximately 700 basis points from the prior year, demonstrating leverage in the business model and the commitment to managing the business in a disciplined manner. Overall, I'm encouraged by our market positioning and executing on the elements within our operational control. Heading into 2024, we have set ourselves up to be a more productive and leaner company in a challenging environment, and Ido and I remain excited by the continuous prospects for long-term growth, and our ability to deliver value to our shareholders. Operator, we're ready to take the first question, please. Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, you'll need to press star 11 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Please wait for your name to be announced. One moment for our first question. Our first question comes from the line of Will Nance with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Hey guys, uh, appreciate you taking the question and appreciate all the, the details on the long-term targets uh, by 2026. So maybe I'll kind of start there. Uh, you know, I think just some kind of back of the envelope math, it seems like you can kind of hit the, the low end of that EBITDA margin target with kind of flattish gross margins, flattish OPEX and revenue growth in the low double digits. Like maybe you can kind of flush out like what kind of puts you at the the lower end or the higher end, and kind of what your what your planning scenarios over the next couple of years sort of look like across some of the key line items. Uh, I think that would be helpful. Hey, well, sure. Um, so look, I think there are a lot of different permutations across revenue, gross margin, and opex that would get us to kind of various scenarios within that range. And I think that. You know, I just have confidence that as a management team, quarter by quarter, as we see how things are progressing, we understand the levers and how to get to, to those areas, um, whether it's, you know, kind of uh, faster traction, some of the newer products, which, you know, help out perform the margin side, whether it's some acceleration on the revenue growth. Um, so, again, a lot of different combinations to take us there. Um, but if I look at, you know, the margin improvements this year, 1,100 basis points, uh, you know, 24 guiding to 700 um, at the midpoint, um, I think we understand how to how to achieve those results in various conditions. 
Got it. That's helpful. So a lot of different ways to hit the range. Um, okay. And then maybe on the gross margin outperformance this quarter, just maybe you could dive a little bit deeper on that. It sounded like a couple of different factors contributing to that, and you know at least some of that is carrying forward into the outlook into uh, into 2024. So. Uh, you know, I think the numbers were something like three or four hundred basis points uh, of outperformance. Like, w- what would you kind of ascribe most of that to, and how should we think about kind of room for further improvements uh, in the gross margins longer term? Yeah, so I think the holistic story is: look, there was a lot of focus from you know the management, the employees post the Q3 fraud event to make sure that we focus and button everything down. Um, but really, it's the technology platform that we've developed over the past few years that allowed us to automatically manage performance um, on an individual level for all of our merchants. Um, it's a combination of you know the holiday season just being safer volumes in general. Um, the fact that we had you know some of the go lives went li- went live later in the quarter, and your merchants tend to start off with a higher um, C- uh, chargeback rate. Um, and in fact, I kind of encourage everyone to look at the the supplemental material. I think there's a very illustrative chart that shows how performance improves for different cohorts over time. Um, so I think all of those factors holistically together, you know, are kind of factored into the outperformance in the quarter. Um, and we're very pleased. We do believe that some of that will carry forward. Uh, but I do want to kind of mention that this is best analyzed on an annual basis. Got it. Super helpful. Appreciate all the uh, all the details in the supplement today as well. Thanks for taking the questions. Thank you. One moment for our next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Ramsey L. Assal with Barclays. Your line is now open. Hi. Good morning, and thanks for taking my question. I wanted to ask about revenue retention, and and maybe ask you to comment a bit further on, you know, given the lower net dollar revenue retention this quarter. Is that you mentioned primarily sort of macro and lower consumer spend as the drivers? I'm just trying to understand: is that sort of like a lower same store sales given macro pressure, rather than you know customers, you know reducing scope or it doesn't sound like exiting the platform? But just any more color you could provide on those dynamics around revenue retention would be would be helpful. Yeah, sure, and uh, thank you for the question. So we do disclose our net dollar retention on an annual basis. I believe that there's a lot of lumpiness uh, during the quarter, but on an annual basis, it presents like a, a good overall picture. I think some of the factors that are going into our net dollar retention this year compared to prior years, um, since IPO, I think that the retention has kind of hovered around 100 this year is a little bit higher than, than last year. Um, but prior to our APO uh, and just uh, during, you know, even before COVID, our net dollar retention rate was 110, 120 plus. And I would say the main factor there was uh, some of the macro trends and some of the growth um, profile in, in, in our merchants at a different kind of macro environment. And since uh, post-COVID, we just haven't seen this type of growth. We actually seen some softness in, in different industries, in different areas, as we've mentioned, um, and that has been driving primarily some of kind of the fluctuations um, from from our historical level. Got it. Okay. And then um, w- one also broad macro question about the e-commerce spending environment. You know what you're seeing now, what you're expecting in 2024 versus what we've seen the past couple of years. I guess the question is, do you, do you think that, where are we now in terms of a normalized e-commerce spending pattern for consumers? I know we've seen you know, goods versus services and travel spending swing around and maybe a discretionary spending pull forward, other sort of cycles within cycles. I know this is kind of a tough question without a crystal ball, but how, where do you think we are now in terms of normalization or, or is this the new normal? I've definitely seen some normalization since uh, in, in the past couple of years. I think that uh, just uh, seeing where our growth is coming out from this year, it's um, tickets and travel continues to be a strong category, but definitely we've seen some normalization from the past two years. Uh, and we've seen some healthy uptick in some of our other categories. As I mentioned, uh, home and fashion, um, due to the addition of new merchants and just like stroll of sale activity, is starting to be a positive trend for us, something that wasn't the case uh, a year or two ago. Uh, so all in all, like just looking at our merchant spends, uh, what we see on our end, I'll say that definitely it's uh, heading towards 
uh, normalization and more kind of healthy contribution from growth from a number of areas. Um, uh, but there's still definitely some softness. We, um, we've kind of mentioned some sub-segments with high luxury fashion or um, sneakers. Um, there's still areas that are continuing to be soft. And more broadly, just kind of looking through industry reports and understanding where we are, I think the macro environment continues still to be uh, tougher in, in kind of in the face of rising interest rates. Um, now there's a prospect that these are going to stabilize or maybe start decreasing. Um, and we're starting to see that some of our merchants that are public companies start to kind of talk about stabilization or even recovery to, you know, better trends in the back half of the year. Um, inflation has appeared to be sticky, but uh, we've seen some normalization in prices, especially across tickets and travel. Uh, and hopefully that this can drive uh, higher consumer demand. So all in all, I think that it's still um, uh, it's still somewhat volatile, but I think we're kind of like on on the on, on the uh, kind of closer, hopefully to to the light at the end of the tunnel with uh, um, hopefully better prospects by the end of this year. Very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. One moment for our next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Chris Kennedy with William Blair. Your line is now open. Good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Can you talk about some of the newer initiatives, the non-chargeback guarantee products and services? You mentioned they don't represent a large portion of revenues today. Can you just talk about when you think they will move the needle? Yeah. I think we have great momentum. So we mentioned that the revenue from them grew 3x in 23, and that for specifically for our policy product in Q4, we saw you know almost over 50% of the go lives of the year went live. So we think the momentum is great, um, and they're also helping us generate more conversations, increase the win rates, also on our core chargeback guarantee, and that helped us result in that kind of uh, 80 plus, almost 80% win rate in the quarter. Um, so we think they're already contributing meaningfully to our success. Um, and I think that the momentum is going to carry forward into 24, and we'll continue to see increased usage of them, and we'll continue to solve more pain points and kind of get it in the hands of more and more clients. Um, and I'm sure that more meaningful revenue uplift will come once we do that. Okay. Thank you. And then... Just real quickly, going back to the net dollar retention, uh, what levers do you have to draw to improve that? Go from 105 percent back to your historical average of 115 to 120. Is there anything that you guys can do to drive improvement there? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, look, if you just think about the way that that number is built, the more we upsell, cross-sell, and better retain our clients, you know, the higher this number will be. Um, we're definitely focused on, on executing on those paths. Um, just to highlight again that if we were to compare today's net dollar retention to that of the prior, you know, prior periods where it was higher, the biggest difference um, is in, in kind of the macro same stores category. Having said that, again, we still focus on the things that are control in order to improve that. Great. Thank you for taking the questions. Thank you. One moment for our next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Terry Tillman with Truist Securities. Your line is now open. Yeah, good morning, Ito, Agi, and Chet. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, nice to see the EBITDA progression. Um, just the first question, it's, it's kind of a mouthful, and then I had a follow-up for um, um, Agi. But, Ito, for you, in terms of you guys have touted in the past this powerful ROI where it drives more revenue and also reduces costs around chargeback. I'm just curious, if you take a step back, where are we in the, percent, uh, the penetration level for a modern kind of next-gen chargeback guarantee platform uh, adoption versus legacy approaches or review solutions, et cetera. I'm just kind of curious where, where you think we are in terms of penetration. And the second part of my question um, is, I think there was a remark about the pipeline being higher. Is this just the market, you know, more people are willing to look at things, or would you attribute it more to the, the platform go-to-market initiatives and, and the investments you've made in your sales and marketing? And then I had a follow-up for Augie. Hey, Terry. Thanks for that. Um, so, look, I think that – let me dissect it into a few different ways. I think that on the platform side, and when I say platform, I include the value for something like policy and the dispute management. 
I think we're just at a stage where, you know, honestly, the technology is catching up to the promise. Um, so I think it's completely underpenetrated. And I think that some of the value that we're seeing that it's generating to merchants is is not um, understood or kind of well played out in the market yet. Uh, for example, one of the, you know, kind of Q4 um, results that we had around policies and, you know, cutting uh, item not received chargebacks basically by half or helping other merchants manage uh, different parts of the business. When you think about just the chargeback guarantee component, you know, while I'm proud of our accomplishments to date, it's still a relatively small uh, portion of the overall e-commerce volume. So I do think that there's still a lot of runway to growth once we have kind of more traction and understanding of the value, and, and we definitely see that increasing. Um, more specifically to what's leading to the stronger pipeline, I think it's hard to isolate a, a one specific thing, but you know, when I think about the initiatives we've undertook over the past two years, like expanding our global go-to-market footprint and building the product platform, those are definitely contributing. Uh, you can see that in the 30 and 40 percent growth, respectively, and you know, kind of LATAM and uh, APAC. Uh, you can see that in you know, kind of the the outperformance on the win rates based on the platform sales. You can see it on the actual platform traction. Um, so it's probably a combination of all that resulting in kind of the global pipeline um, improvements that we're seeing. That, that's really helpful. Thanks for all that color there. And I guess, Augie, just for you in terms of the free cash flow, you, I think you said about $30 million for the year. Is there anything we should consider seasonality-wise or maybe there's some cash, you know, kind of ca uh, cash expenses because of the restructuring? Just trying to understand how we flow the $30 million in the year. Thank you. Yeah, Terry, um, I did generally say $30 million, uh for 2024. It's, uh, I don't have any more precise um, kind of spread. Maybe it's going to follow mostly some of the uh, some of the trends around uh, adjusted EBITDA as well, and um, more particularly, probably Q4 is just uh, tends to uh, to carry some of the receivables from uh, Q1 tends to carry the receivables from from Q4. So maybe some adjustments there as well, um, but um, nothing to provide more kind of more precise around that right now. Just on an annual basis, around 30. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of uh, Timothy Scioto with UBS. Your line is now open. Great. Thank you for taking the question. I'm looking at slide 26 in the investor deck, and I appreciate that during the remarks earlier, you mentioned that it was a very Q4 heavy year in terms of new merchant activity. I believe you said about one third of new merchants boarded in uh, Q4. You also noted the refined sales strategy and that the teams overall met the revenue goals for the year. From the chart, if there's any additional context on the 2023 cohort that you could provide, may, is it maybe that the sales teams met the goals this year a little bit more by gaining wallet share with existing customers relative to bringing on new logos? Is that a fair conclusion from looking at this table? Or if there's anything else that you could help us with related to slide 26? That would be appreciated. Yeah, I think the distribution between new and upsells is somewhat similar with prior years. So I don't think there's anything unique or different to call out in, in that regards. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just looking at the... It's oh, go ahead, go ahead, Aggie, sorry. Yeah, just to, to kind of okay. uh, point as well, it's relatively even, even between new and uh, upsell. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for taking the question. Thank you. One moment for our next question, please. Our next question comes from the line of Brent Bracelin with Piper Sandler. Your line is now open. Good morning. Uh, thank you uh, for taking the question here. Uh, great to see uh, the uh, commitment to uh, uh, profitability here going forward. Um, my question, as we think about the growth profile of this business, it, it looks like on an annual basis we're stabilizing in, in the low teens. Uh, my question is, as you look forward, it does sound like the pipeline's a little stronger in this year versus last year. What's the algorithm to accelerate growth from here? As you think about upside levers, is it going to be expanding customers at a faster pace? 
Is it going to be the new product cross sell? Just just walk us through how you're thinking about maybe over a three year period how you accelerate growth from here. Thanks. No, that's a great question. I mean, look, what we focus internally that we believe will lead to kind of faster growth rates is is one selling more globally. So that's part of the international expansion, which you know we kind of highlighted the 30 and 40 percent growth. Um, second is you know generating more revenue and more sales from the platform, from policy dispute, account protection. So that would be number two. And number three is making sure that that helps us win more core chargeback guarantee deals, even in some of our kind of established markets. Um, you know, retaining merchants at a better rate, even though it's it's very high today, would also be meaningful. So I think those are all the areas within our scope of control that we're focused on um, that we believe could lead to accelerated growth. Now, obviously, the macro being outside of our control, which can also lead to that. Um, and to your kind of point, well, hey, you know, if, if the pipeline and everything, what's different this year because the net dollar retention is picking up, I think that we tend to work on a slightly smaller amount of larger deals. Um, you know, I think we mentioned that we have over 50 accounts, each generates over a million in revenue for us. And just the timing of when in the year um, those accounts go live can have a meaningful impact on, on the calendar year revenue. So that's also probably something to mention. Fair enough. And, and then just back to that third point, the winning more chargeback deals with existing customers. What's your best guess, the percent of volume attached uh, that, that you have across your, your largest customer base? Is it 50% of volumes? Is it 80% of volumes? Any sort of level set for us as just we think about that third lever to accelerate growth, where you're at today as a baseline? Sure, that's a great question. I mean, it's after a lot, lots of ins and outs throughout the year, um, we're kind of around the 30, 30 plus percent range, which is actually a bit similar to, to historical years. Helpful color. My last qu question is really around automation. You mentioned several uh, internal efforts to, to further automate some of the internal processes and procedures to be able to to, to ramp capacity uh, and drive leverage. Could you double click into the most, the biggest change from an automation standpoint that you, you, you're seeing success with? That would be helpful, thanks. Sure, so I think we've created a platform that allows us to manage approval rates and chargeback rates in an automated way per merchant. All right, so uh, it's something that you historically, someone would actually have to look at the performance and maybe manage the, the models or the different thresholds. And just the fact that, you know, we were able to roll this out and have a high enough confidence in the performance of this platform allows us to onboard merchants pretty much at an endless scale um, while maintaining the very kind of unique um, performance metrics that the chargeback guarantee model can provide. Helpful color, thank you, and great to see the uh, commitment to profitable growth going forward. Thanks. Thank you. One moment for our next question. Our next question comes from the line of Reggie Smith with J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the question. I, I joined late, so this may have been covered, uh, but I was curious what – I guess kind of uh, broader e-com growth assumptions are um, are embedded in your 24 guidance, and it sounds like you may have given longer term guidance. Maybe if you could talk about what you're thinking about, um, you know, over that horizon as well. And then um, I guess it's kind of implicit in your guidance, but like, what's the internally? How do you guys think about the growth algorithm? Is it e-com plus? Um, Ecom time some ratio or, or what's the um, the internal uh, view there and I have a follow up thank you of course Reggie thank you for the question so just thinking about the first half of the year it's uh, um, the broader uh, economy and uh, kind of like picture I don't think anything is much different than than what we saw in 2023 inflation continues to be sticky and consumer spending relying on on more on, on credit, it's just uh, 
potentially more of the same the first half of the year, I think. Um, and then um, going into the second half of the year, um, there's more optimism around potential stabilization or, or recovery. Um, but again, too early to say right now. So we try to be kind of balanced in our approach. We, we, we talk to our merchants, we look at the industry reports, and we factor in, um, we factor in what we see. Uh, but potential, potentially, if things recover and they're much more optimistic and faster, that can be a positive effect. And uh, if things um, continue to be uh, kind of completely sluggish like last year, that can be um, probably more of like a, a neutral to negative effect, um, depending on uh, where we think about our guides. Got it. Okay. Um, that's good. So basically, assuming stability. Um, I guess you called out, you know, highlighted several policy protect implementations in the fourth quarter. Um, I was curious, was there a reason that they all kind of flipped on at the same time? Um, and maybe talk a little bit about the lead time for that type of um, upsell. Is, is, yeah, is there a reason that the fourth quarter would be particularly strong? And did you have any, any um, view or insight of that? coming uh, ahead of time, so lead time. Thank you. I think we've made a lot of progress in, in the technology throughout the year, and we've added more and more use cases. And as we've onboarded more merchants and have more testimonials and solve more use cases and understand better the ROI and how to sell it, it just naturally leads to better movement and traction. Um, specifically, these are cross-sells mainly to existing merchants. Um, so the additional integration is very simple, um, and the, the entire process from selling it to going live is, is not time-consuming. Got it. And if I could sneak one more in, thinking about kind of the, uh, the, the pipeline that you guys talked about, uh, and looking at, you know, kind of slide 23 in the presentation, um, is the same kind of mix? Are you seeing the same mix in terms of uh, new um, pipelines? Does it kind of approximate the current volume mix? Are you seeing any uh, pockets of strength in any particular geography that, that would deviate from historic um, or your existing billings? Yeah. I think we continue to see more and more pipelines across. The platform continue to see it across the global areas where we have shown recent strains. So I would say it's diversified and reflected in kind of the overall performance of the business, the pipeline. Um, so nothing unique to call out there. So roughly consistent with, with the current uh, billing. Yeah, I would say so. Thank you. Thank you. I'm currently showing no further questions at this time. I'd like to turn the call back over to Mr. Ido Gao, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, for closing remarks. Thank you, everyone, for joining. The team and I are very excited for the year ahead, and we look forward to updating you on our progress. And this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Everyone have a wonderful day.